Hi, welcome everybody. So now we start the BioXL webinar. Today's webinar is uh, number 60, and we are happy to have Michelle Mendoza from European Bioinformatic Institute that will tell us about social media in science communication. I'm Alessandra Villa from the Royal Institute of Technology, and with me is Arno Prum from the University of Edinburgh. Michelle, something is a digital strategic offer or MBI, MBL in ABI. And so it's uh, responsible for uh, driving social media strategy and it's helping a lot in create uh, in the creation for topics for uh, several projects, including BioXL COE, that is the one organizing this webinar. So in her role, she's combining science and passion for storyteller to develop an effective social media campaign. So his work is driven by data, and he always tries to follow the last trend, ensuring the standards practice of accessibility and digital platform. Michelle holds a master's degree in biotechnology from the University of Melbourne. So now I stop sharing and I give the word to Michelle. Welcome. Thank you. I'm just going to share screen. Perfect. Okay. So hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's webinar on social media in science communication. Uh, my name is Michelle Mendoza, and I am the digital strategy officer at Emily BI. Um, so just a little bit about me. Uh, I manage the social media content creation and overall digital strategy for BioXL, among a number of other projects at Emily BI. Um, I also help run training courses on how to use Twitter for the scientific research community, uh, along with my colleague, Vera Matso. So what are we going to cover today? So today we're going to talk about the evolution of social media in science communication uh, as affected by the pandemic. Uh, I'm going to talk about three examples of organizations and individuals that I think are acing the social game. Um, and, and lastly, I'm going to cover personal branding if you want to be on social media and some do's and don'ts along with it. Along with it. So with the onset of the pandemic, uh, we saw this uh, entire revolution of how uh, businesses and organizations op uh, operate. And we've seen uh, that digital uh, adoption has taken a quantum leap um, uh, among these organizations. As you can see by this, by this graph, we've seen that that progression from, you know, the adoption, uh, adoption has accelerated quite significantly with a lot of a lot of the customers moving towards online channels and a lot of respondents even say that uh, according to this McKinsey report that they are more 80% likely now to be digitally aligned versus uh, prior to the pandemic so as you can see by this graph that has significantly significantly increased uh, across the time period of three years and this is not it's globally but also in different areas of the world like in Asia Pacific Europe and North America. Now with people moving online and while we had the pandemic, while we still have the pandemic, there was a lot of misinformation that was going online because misinformation is not a new thing that, that has been going on for years and years. But with the access to social media and the access to um, you know, posting something very readily, um, we've seen this rise of misinformation and the rise of anti-vaccination and mask messages that were coming across. Now, a survey by the Royal Society for Public Health said that 50% of parents of children younger than five years regularly encountered negative messages about vaccination on social media. So how, how, did, how, do we, uh, and how do we counter this? And we saw this rise of public health officials you know, who were credible in their fields taking to social media to help counter, um, counter this misinformation that was going on. So we saw that WHO, uh, the World Health Organization had recognized, okay, this, this is an issue. A lot of the social media platforms as well had recognized this issue and they had started flagging misinformation. But a, a good initiative that was taken was that the WHO started partnering with influencers and they launched something called as a uh, the hashtag uh, safe hands challenge where basically it was um, uh, was focusing on you know hand hygiene and how post so what they did was they asked uh, influencers like selena gomez some major footballers uh, to you know show showcase their vi videos of themselves washing their hands which was kind of a, a huge messaging um, that was delivered right at the start of the pandemic we also saw data scientists partnering with micro influencers to spread facts on covid 19 and vaccines on social media so we saw how important it was at that point uh, for a credible scientist to be on there to help counter, um, counter those misinformation that was occurring at that time. So 
um, as you've seen that the evolution and the importance of how much um, being on social media at that time came into play, we've also seen how differently people, people across the globe have been trying to improve their social media game across, across the years. And according to me, I, among the number of campaigns that we have seen, I have picked out three, three campaigns that have stood out to me. Um, so the first one being the Royal Society of Chemistry. Uh, now this, um, uh, the Royal Society of Chemistry organizes the RC poster Twitter conference, which is basically an annual online event that is held entirely over Twitter to bring the scientific community to share their research and network. It's a great way for early career researchers to literally post their, uh, talk about their research and put their posters up there. And what the RC does is then they pick out their, I know, I think five or six best posters and then they make a whole Twitter thread about it. It's a a great great uh, way of holding a conference because one it removes environmental and financial cost and the only thing you need is to create a free twitter account which is great because it's accessible to pretty much every everyone across the globe um, this is some of the examples of some of the tweets you can see uh, some of the researchers have put up their different posters it's great because you can see the entire you literally have to click on that hashtag and the entire on the constantly every day you can see a lot of these posters coming up and it's a great way to get involved with the, with the research. The second one is John Hopkins University. This one stood out a lot to me because I think, as I mentioned about the rise in misinformation and the, and the anti-mask messaging that was going on, uh, John Hopkins found this, okay, how do, we, how do we break this such complex piece of information because people were not having the information to how do these vaccines are made and how did they get approved so quickly. So they made a short YouTube video on the story of the vaccine by creating such a, by breaking down that complex information into a more digestible format using animations. That video got across about 50,000 views, which was very successful. And another one, which is my favorite, is um, the Twitter. Uh, on Twitter, they launched a campaign called as, um, you know, Wear a Mask, Please, which was kind of a parody on um, a very popular song that came out in 2019 by a US female ra rapper, Nicki Minaj. She made a song and what they did was they used that song and they put the lyrics of, you know, wearing a mask where they had the mascot wearing the mask. And it went, wild, it went viral across, uh, you know, different, a different news site picked it up. And it kind of, you know, bought a hilarious and, um, and then so, people made people focus on how important wearing a mask is, but also brought it a more comedic way of looking at it, which was, which was great because you brought in a new audience to look at that. And then finally, my, one of my other favorites is Raven, the science maven. So Raven is a science communicator. She's um, an internationally acclaimed science educator and molecular biologist um, who works to progress inclusive science culture. Um, her USP is basically combining science and music. So what she does is she takes comp uh, she takes topics such as molecular biology, recently the vaccines, recently uh, long COVID diseases that probably some people are not aware of, and she uses rap um, to basically talk about again concepts that sometimes it's difficult to understand. What she she breaks them down in using music videos that she creates herself, um, and you know she uses her YouTube platform which she's very good at, and she creates relatable content about you know can I be a scientist? Um, Q and A with me. Tell she's currently I think she just finished her PhD and she talked about her entire PhD journey um, using different videos, and I think that's really beautiful because it talks about again. Um, things that are generally, you know, difficult to understand versus maybe a, using a paper, but a research paper, but then she uses video content to basically bring those concepts alive. So why, why did I choose these three, you know, these three organizations, these three organizations, individuals, what, what stood out? I think they have a common thread amongst all of them. And that is the first one is identifying the right audience. And when I mean audience, I don't mean the general public. So this is a con common misconception that a lot of people have is that you know, when they list audience, they list audience as general public, which doesn't exist because general public can include anyone and, and, and everyone. And that's not what you want to do. When we talk about audience, we want to talk exactly who we are trying to target. So with, um, let's say with the RSC poster, what they were doing is they were targeting early career researchers in chemistry who were looking to showcase their poster. Um, so what they were doing was exactly targeting that audience and making sure that that campaign was successful. They were able to address a knowledge gap uh, with with uh, Dr. Raven, she was she she saw that okay there was a need of understanding of okay maybe how does this disease work why why do certain people get it versus why certain people don't she understood okay there is a mis misinformation there there is not an understanding there so let me bring that bring that knowledge into a more fun and relatable way so she made music around that and clear and effective communication with John Hopkins um, they saw this need of okay we need to bring out why how this vaccine was developed and they used. Um, a three to five minute video and made a clear using animations. They made a clear, very simple way of 
communicating how that vaccine was developed versus maybe if you put out like a 180 page document, no one's going to read that. But if I can sit down and watch a three minute video, I know I'm now going to understand, ah, okay, this is how, why it, you know, got progressed so quickly. And this, that, that story then becomes an easier way for people to understand how a vaccine is made. So now these three, three principles, I think, is, is key in general messaging across platforms. And this is something that I generally in, um, integrate into my, into my study and into my, um, the way I work as well. So now I'm just going to talk a little bit about how then Biocell use these principles as well to build a community in uh, biomolecular research. So um, why, why were we on social media in the first place? So when I started the account, uh, when I was handed over the account, um, I, we probably had around, what, 500 followers. And I realized, OK, um, our importance being on Twitter is is there is a great importance for us to be on Twitter. But the reason why we do that is because one, you get real time interaction. So anytime I, I put up across an event, I can tell that this event is going to be popular or maybe it's not going to be popular because you are going to see that, it, that engagement through likes or through shares. So it tells me exactly what the community wants. I'm getting instant feedback. So once we put up a webinar or if we put up a research paper out there, people immediately start sharing. They talk about it and they tell me if this is good or this is not good. And that gives me a good feedback, uh, uh, which I can feed back to the team and tell them, okay, you know what, these topics are relevant. Let's let's make more of this, or let's write a blog post about this because people want to know more information. And that that gives me um, that that feeds back into the team and helps us develop further. And listening and engaging, I think it's because there are so many conversations that happen that probably don't relate relate to us directly, but are in are important in the conversation. So, for example, people are looking for a certain kind of training and they're talking about you know what i want to look i want to learn more about qmm i want to learn more about gromax but i don't have access to that i can read those conversations and that conversations is important because it then tells us okay this is a con this is a topic that people want to hear about so maybe we should be working on that so the approach that i just described is basically a community first approach where i looked at who is our audience as i mentioned your audience has to be very specific so in our case it was early career researchers who are looking for training who are looking for courses uh, basically who are looking to upskill in their in their career level what are their pain points are what kind of courses are they looking for why do they want to upskill is there specific blockers that we can help as a as a, as a coe to help you know progress into their career level are there specific you know um, areas so for example if you want to do a new version of gromax is what 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 is the um, problems that the community is facing while using the current version so listening to those those factors and how does bioxel add to value to their lives Often we often see that when, when you run a Twitter as an organization or even as yourself, you're often thinking, oh, I want to put this out, I want to put that out, but you're never thinking what does the community actually benefit from that. It's not about you know constantly bombarding them with, we are doing this event, we're doing that event, because at, after a point, people don't care. They, they want to see how you can actually add, add, add value to their lives. So what I'm doing is actually seeing, okay, if this training is not benefiting them, why are we doing this? Then there's no point of me putting out, if not the training, then why, if this blog post is not of interest to the community, you know, what it's not going to go out let's put out something that that is important to them so that's the approach i took forward um through through the twitter account that we had and what was the outcome of it so the outcome was that we have this flagship event called as the bioxcel summer school and we've seen that the applications increased from 80 which was generally what we were getting per year to approximately 160 which is the highest we've ever reached for an event and that's huge um, we also saw higher participation in webinars and we've seen increased engagement on twitter one of my favorite tweets that I've ever received uh, as a social media manager was from a Twitter user, Mohammed Shaheta. Um, he's always constantly being engaging with our tweets, but also I think he, what he did was he made a meme, like a popular meme was flying around at that point, and he added Bioxcel into that. And I think that was lovely because we didn't ask him to do that. He did that by himself, but that just shows how much it meant to him that he did, then decided to generate a meme, um, you know, using Bioxcel and how much it added value to his life. So I think that was that is one of the nicest thing to see being, um, you know, we're using the community first approach. Now I've talked to all, all about, you know, being as an organization and all of these other things is, you know, being why we should be on social media. But if you are an individual and you are interested to be on social media, why should you? And the reasons are, the first one is obviously it builds awareness of your research. Um, you know, you obviously scientists have, uh, 
want to publish papers and that's great because you know you get your research out there but what happens is with research papers it only circulates among a certain population certain section of population that has access to those research and what what's happening is you're not then going beyond that beyond that uh, little bubble that you have with by being on social media it's literally having everyone having access um, to to what you're doing it also establishes cred 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 credibility as a leader when I talked about the public health officials, you know, how important it was for them to come back uh, on social media and combat those misinformation to actually give the facts. It's, um, you know, it, it gives you more credibility when you speak about a certain topic, um, because when you're constantly talking about it, people look up to you then and say, OK, so tomorrow, if I want to know about molecular biology, I know I have to come to this person. If I want to know about HPC, I know this person is the one tweeting about it because I've seen them. They're posting uh, links to different papers or links to different facts that that is relevant to me. And last but not the least, I think which is a very underrated um, feature is networking opportunities and finding a community. When I started off in this industry, I, you know, most of the things that I learned was literally by, you know, networking with people that were working similar to me. I didn't have anyone around me who was in the same field as me. What I did was I just reached out to different people via, via DMs. And that's the beauty of social media is there is no hierarchy. You can literally reach out to a CEO. You can reach out to... Uh, someone in the middle management, you can reach out to anyone that you generally admire and you can just literally shoot them a direct message or just comment below any of their posts and say, hey, I think you're really great. Can we connect on this? And generally people are more inclined to reply on that versus a cold email. And you, you also find a community because um, there are so many communities I've seen, uh, you know, where PhD students talk about their, their struggles, they talk about their research, then you have postdocs, and then you have people who are more, maybe more advanced in the industry who are looking for how to upskill. And you have these different communities that are, are, that are online, and it's great to talk about the same similar interests that sometimes they don't exist around you in, in maybe in your lab or maybe in the office. So I think those are, those are some of the reasons of why, why should one, you should be on social media. Now let's talk about some of the commonly used platforms. You've decided, okay, I wanna be on social media, but which one should I be on? So let's talk about some of them. So we have, we have um, you know, the, the popular ones here obviously are Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, LinkedIn, YouTube, and the most recent one, obviously TikTok. Personally, I love TikTok because it's got, you know, all my favorite content. It's got comedy, dance, it's got um, hilarious takes on everything in life. Um, and then obviously followed closely by Twitter. So these are my favorite platforms, um, but, you know, you, you and you you've decided, OK, these are these are all the platforms, but how do I decide which one to be on? And these are some of the factors that that uh, affected. So, um, you know, every every platform is affected by the age, location and interest. So, um, for example, if you look in Latin America, Facebook is the one that's that's dominating in that country. So if you are in Latin America, it just makes more sense to be on Facebook. If you're on Europe, then it's Twitter. If, if you're in India, again, it's Facebook. So you have to look at which platform your, your area is and also which what your interests are. So if you're looking for more video-based content, then obviously you want to lean towards YouTube and Instagram. If you are leaning towards more text-based, more short form, then it's Twitter and probably Facebook. And if it's more professional, then it's LinkedIn. So depending on what you're looking at, uh, choose, you know, you can select a couple of platforms that, that you want to lean towards. But, but this is, again, another, um, you know, common misconception. And I give this advice to everyone. You don't have to be on all platforms, whether you're an organization or whether you're an individual, choose one and that, that works for you. That one that you genuinely enjoy, because there is no point being on a platform that you cannot, like, for example, I love TikTok. That's why I'm on TikTok. I don't like on I don't like Facebook. It's not my favorite platform, which is why I generally don't tend to be there in, or personally. Um, but when you want to share messaging, you have to genuinely enjoy the platform you are on. And if you're on an org on organization, then you are going to spread yourself very thin by trying to be on all different types of platform because they all work very differently. And if you are not well versed in how they work, you're going to find a really hard time to trying trying to be on all of them. So my advice is all just choose one platform that we, you genuinely enjoy that works for you and you can tailor the content according to that. So now let's talk about how do you optimize your social media prof profile. So if you are new to this and or you have been there for a while and you want to see, okay, I want to get better at doing this, let's look at it um, from a broad perspective. Now, a social, this the one example that I have is from Twitter, but obviously every profile is made of the same three components, um, the header, profile photo, and your bio. 
Now, I say your social media profile is kind of like your elevator pitch or your first impressions. Whenever you visit a social media profile, the first thing you want to look at is uh, make sure you have a good header picture. That can be anything. That can be any banner that you want to select. Profile photo, have a good profile photo. If you don't want to put your photo in there, that's fine. But make sure you have something on there. It should not be like the blank egg or whatever. Make sure that if you don't want to put your own photo, you can put an animation of, of anything else. That's fine. And have a complete bio because before someone presses follow on you know, Twitter, LinkedIn, whichever platform, the first thing they come and look at is your bio. And if it doesn't state what you do, you know, you're, high, you're gonna have less chances of people actually want to engage with you because they don't really know what they're stepping in for. So make sure you have a nice, attractive, short, snappy bio for people to read into before they, before they follow you. Now let's talk about what makes a good post. Um, Always keep it short and simple. Now, there are different platforms that restrict you. For example, Twitter has a word limit of 280 characters. Uh, Facebook and Instagram uh, don't really have that. So you can, you, you can go ahead and do that. But the shorter, the better, because you're always in, you know, people are, have come across like thousands and thousands of posts every day. They're not going to sit and read through art, you know, long forms of text if you're, you're going to constantly write more. So always make sure what you're writing is short and simple. Uh, keep it to 200 to 300 words. Use images. Post with images generally get two to three times more engagement. Obviously, make sure they're relevant. You don't have to use it for the sake of it, but it's always good to use one. Be careful with using images if you don't own the copyright because you don't want to steal images from other people's work. Make sure you're crediting when you are using other people's images. And if you don't have any, then just there are plenty of websites that actually helps you source free images. So you can go to unsplash.com, pexels.com. They have lots of lots of images for you to use. Um, the third one, which I say is do not overuse hashtags. Now, this is one of my biggest pet peeve. Um, uh, again, this is very tailored to different platforms. Now on Instagram, yes, hashtags is fine because that's exactly how the algorithm functions. If you're on Twitter, um, LinkedIn still okay, but if you're on Twitter, no, it's a big no-no according to me. Now, you, the only place when you would use a hashtag is if you are targeting an event. So if you have an event-based hashtag, that's okay because that's how you will track different posts and you want people to tweet about your event. So yeah, it's always good to have an event hashtag. But in general, no, because the algorithm has changed since, you know, since Twitter was launched. Yes, there was an emphasis on hashtags. Now, in fact, if you use more than two, three hashtags in a post, Twitter is automatically going to start restricting your, uh, your post because that's, they generally don't want you to do that. The way Twitter works is that it focuses on the keyword, just like, and, and this is not only restricted to Twitter, this, restricted, this, is, this applies to every social media platform. They focus on the keyword, which is basically the word you're typing in. So instead of saying hashtag science is awesome, I would just say science is awesome. And if you look at any viral tweets or any viral content across, they do not have hashtags. So um, minimize that mostly also because it doesn't read that well. Avoid jargon. This is a huge one as well. So I've just given an example here. So if you can see the before says, did you know that adult male chickens can propel themselves up to 200 feet in the air? Meanwhile, roosters don't lay eggs. Also, roosters crow at sunrise. In this blog post, we will talk about roosters. Now that looks just a lot of sentences that don't seem to be telling me what I'm going to be reading about. Now, if you look up to the after statement, it says, did you know that roosters can fly up to 200 feet? In this blog post, we will discuss the rooster's aerodynamic abilities. So this tells me exactly what I'm going to read. And that's a great way of writing clear and effective messaging. Now, obviously, you don't want to be you know, using extreme oversimplified language, because if you're talking to a scientific audience, that's not the aim. But um, you can use a certain scientific terminology when it's accepted within your audience. But what I mean is use simplified words because we're not in a fancy writing competition. What we're trying to do is get clear and effective messaging. In certain contexts, yes, you might want to use you know, complicated words, but this is not the case. You want to use plain language as much as possible. So in case, instead of using utilize, objective, facilitate, illustrate, locate, change that all to use, goal, help, explain, find. You can go to any plain language website and it's going to give you synonyms of all of these words. And I try to improve that as much as possible because my main aim is not to confuse the reader and not to make my sentences as complicated as it has to be. I want it to be as simple that the reader can read in maybe a couple of seconds and get the messaging across. So always make sure that your language is as simple and plain as possible. Now I'm going to talk about something that is probably not talked enough in within while we use social media, and that's accessibility best practices. Um, 
Now, the reason why we our content should be accessible is because we have a huge chunk of the population that does have visual and cognitive disabilities. Now, if your content is not accessible, you're kind of you're removing that whole or you're restricting, you're limiting your reach of your post and they don't get to access what you're what you're putting out there. When you put something out there on social media, you don't know who it is going to. Basically, you're putting it out there and the algorithm will push it. So the more you don't make it accessible, the more the algorithm is not going to favor that content. So how can you do that? You, you, add, you make your content accessible by adding alternative text. So what is alternative text? It's basically a word or phrase to tell the viewers what the content of an image is. So it's basically to describe what your image is. And how can you do that? So when you, when you, and accessible, um, all text is available on all social media platforms. So whenever you upload an image, um, you can, you will give you something like an ad description on Twitter. You can see I've added one for LinkedIn. Um, it exists on Facebook. Um, all social media platforms have access to that. All you have to do is click on that ad description button and you just have to write a quick couple of lines of what the image consists. And this is, this is applicable to websites as well. Websites have an alt, uh, alt text as well. So make sure you, include that as well. So what happens here is in this alt text, what would I add? So since this is more text heavy, I would just write whatever's in that image. So social media and science communication, 17 February, 15 CET. If it's an image of a person, then you can describe. So for example, if it's image of myself, I would say a woman with wearing glasses, with black hair and a red t-shirt. There are a lot of good websites that actually tell you how to describe an image. So I would highly encourage you to look at that. And it takes practice. I generally did not know anything about alt text when I started off in the industry. It took me, again, I, I was on Twitter and I learned, I followed people who were very good at this and that's how um, I became better at writing alt text. So it's something we just have to keep on learning and, and um, as social media gets better at doing this. Another bit you want to do is using camel case in hashtags. When camel case is basically capitalizing the first letter when you add two words in a hashtag. So for example, if you have hashtag molecular biology, you want to capitalize the first letter of each word. The reason being is that the screen reader, which is basically, I didn't describe what that is. So a screen reader is basically an access, um, accessibility tool used by people with visual impairments. It's basically like a browser extension where uh, it basically describes the, what the image is. So, or, or for example, or describes, or it reads out text. So when you put hashtag uh, molecular biology, and if you didn't capitalize it, it would just read it as one word. Now that sometimes doesn't make, it, it might make sense in molecular biology, but there are certain words that you have to capitalize. Otherwise they will not read, they will not read well. Also, it also does not read well in general if you do not capitalize, because if you have a complicated word, it's just going to read it. You're not going to understand, you know. So, for example, if I say um, in case of this, you know, just, just a hypothetical sentence, if you had to hashtag something like that, if I didn't capitalize everything, it would not make sense to a reader of what you're trying to say. So make sure you capitalize um, the, the first and first letter of each word. Um, if you're adding a lot of um, videos, if say, for example, if you're on Instagram or if you're adding it even on Twitter or LinkedIn, make sure they always have captions. And another big pet peeve I have is make sure that you always limit, limit your emoji used to two to three and use it at the end of the text. The reason why is because, for example, if I had a text and I had three smiley faces at the beginning, the screen reader is going to read it as smiley face, smiley face, smiley face and the text and then if you had maybe a couple more emojis then it's going to read smiley face smiley face smiley face something that would have would which should take two to three seconds for it to read is going to take thing now 10 to 20 seconds and the person is going to click off again you're limiting the person uh, you're limiting your content from that person you're just making it more inaccessible and again the emojis are more it looks good yeah sure for the post but it's not functional and it is not accessible uh, so I would, if you want, if you really have to use an emoji, I would encourage you to, instead of using, so for example, if you want to use bullet points, use, use the dash, dashes or use the, you know, the normal functions that you have on your keyboard, rather than using the emojis. You have a lot of uh, fancy emojis that you have access to, but I would just stick to the normal traditional because yeah, emojis can make it look nice and pretty, but it's not functional. Now, when... So that's that's the about the accessibility bits. So now when we talk about as you constantly are on social media, as you can constantly post content, you are going to get comments. And that's that's fine. That's just generally how it works. So how do you handle negative feedback online? And this is this is something to understand is that if you all feedback that you get, you know, all negative feedback is not bad. Sometimes, yes, you know, there is there is a chance as humans, we do post incorrect information. Uh, sometimes we 
we post something you know that is not correct and it's okay so if you do that you can and if you receive criticism or post something with errors engage respectfully and send a correction if needed if it's completely wrong it's okay to delete a post and say oh i made a mistake i deleted the post the world is not going to end it's fine and if you see sometimes people neg- um, having you know a, a lot of conversations and you feel that this is not you know you don't want to make this public make sure you can take it to a direct message and have that conversation out there um there is obviously a difference between negative feedback and trolling always stay away from the trolls you can see that if you post something about vaccination you'll see always anti vaccination anti vaccination messages coming across generally those people are there to fuel your anger and you don't want to engage with that do not fuel the trolls because that just makes them you know just makes them better at what they do so disengage with that um and if you're not sure about okay does it make sense or not consult with a colleague consult with a friend i always make sure that sometimes if something doesn't make sense to me i will write it um different times i will show it to a friend and say okay does this read well or does it not read well or if you have access to a communications department always go to them because they obviously have access to all the tools that they need and um they can tell you if you know so sometimes there are a different crises and it sometimes it makes sense to put something and it doesn't for example if you were during the pandemic and you talked about a face to face right at the beginning you know when things were locking down and you talked about we are going to have a face to face event obviously that's insensitive so make sure that if there are some things that you're not sure about consult with someone who understands the current current uh, crisis and can help you out with that and lastly i think it's very very important to be yourself um be authentic and true to yourself it's okay to talk about your life and personal interests as per your comfort level um if you met someone in face to face and all they talked about was bioinformatics for the rest of the lives you're going to get annoyed after a point and think okay this is great for you know my job okay and yeah once in a while okay but you want to learn a little bit more about the person you're following i especially really like that i like people who are a little bit more human relatable um again you don't have to share every single detail of your life and if you don't feel like you don't want to put that part of yourself out there that's absolutely okay you don't have to do that but sometimes it's nice to if you if you want to build a following it's nice people like to see the relatable bits about you so if you really like movies you like food you like you know board games talk about that talk about your personal interests you will find a community that really wants to then learn about that aspect of your life and that makes it more interesting um also putting the social in social media i think this is a bit people tend to forget is when you put out content you always think okay i'm going to put talk about this i'm going to talk about that but you're not really engaging with the people that are there online and that's the point of the whole of social media is to it's a two way street it can never be one way even as organizations if you're only constantly talking about look at these events like this is what i'm going to do people are not going to engage with you back you always you know have to talk if someone shares something about you comment you know if as an organization talk retweet them or if you are um, you know if you have someone who said something below your post uh, where you talked about your research paper comment and have a conversation out there that's the whole point of engaging with people out there um and uh, another tip i can give uh, over here is that when i first started tweeting i was very overwhelmed and i was like i can't put myself out there i think this is just you know it's it's too much i i can get very overwhelmed so what i did was i just started retweeting i found that easier than actually putting out a tweet and what i would do is comment so another tip i would give is just comment below people's post so you don't actually have to tweet directly just you know if you see someone saying oh i you know they post about a research paper comment below their post and say oh i think this is really important and that gives you a confidence of actually putting yourself out there more and um, you know it gets you better at writing uh, so and then when you feel confident enough you can actually tweet your own content and then finally social media and mental health it's very important to understand that yes it can be very overwhelming when you start off um you know there's constant you know there's there's a lot of information going out there it's easy to doom scroll and think oh my god how am i going to keep up with all of this information and the the point is you don't have to you have to just curate the timeline and as and that the algorithm will do it for you the more say if the more post if i like about board games it's just going to be showing me more about board games so you can curate the timeline that that looks good for you and you don't have to be there online 24/7 if there are days that you don't want to be there that's okay there's no hard and fast rule here it's okay to take mental health breaks and make sure you reserve dedicated hours for yourself so for example when i started off i was just you know working weekends i was working every single day because that's kind of how the job was but then i realized now that was not giving there was not impacting me positively so um i had to then say okay not going to do it from you know 9 to 5 okay and then after that i'm not going to touch it so that's that's generally even for my personal social media use so just make sure that you have the dedicated hours that you have once as you're getting slowly into it and i think once you become a pro 
And once you're used to it, then it becomes a lot more easier. So let's summarize what I've been talking about so far. So obviously choose a platform that works for you. You don't have to be there on all of them. Um, choose one that you genuinely enjoy and that, that is you know, popular within your location and use that. Uh, identify audience, be very, very specific about who you're actually trying to target rather than just saying, oh, I'm gonna to try to target everyone because that just generally doesn't work. Um, keep it short, simple and accessible. The shorter, the snappier, the better and be authentic and true to your messaging. Don't put something out there that doesn't, you know, that doesn't feel true to yourself. And that's it. So I would like to thank Alessandra um, and Arno for this opportunity. It was great to be on here. And um, if you, anyone want to just get in touch, you know, I don't really talk about science a lot. My Twitter is mostly about movies and F1. I've just started being getting into F1. So I really enjoy that. And um, Bollywood and things like that. So if you want to follow, it's Mishros2. Um, my LinkedIn is Michelle Mendoza, and that's my email address. If you just want, or if you had any questions um, beyond anything else, feel free to shoot a DM, and I'm happy to take any questions right now. Okay, Michelle, thank you very much. Very interesting talk. I think you covered very nicely uh, both the aspects of an organiz organization, uh, you know, how, how an organization should consider engaging on social media and also how individuals uh, should consider engaging on social media, both for, you know, I guess personally, but also yeah, in terms of their career and everything. So it's very nice, thank you. We have already a couple of questions. Um, if anybody has not yet asked a question and you have, have something in mind, uh, just use the, the, the Q&A button uh, in Zoom, click that and a little window will open up and you can enter your question there. Um, so I will read out the questions uh, and then uh, let Michelle answer. Uh, so the first question is um, from uh, Pirat. She asks, uh, how would you grab the audience's attention if it's not in the organization's brand to use memes? Uh, smiley face. Okay, so if um, so, what I understood is that you, if your organization doesn't use memes, do you, um, hold on, can you read that question again? That's a good question. Yeah, so essentially that's it. I, I think so. the question is, how would you grab the audience's attention if it's not in the organization's brand to use memes? So I guess, okay. yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay, so the, uh, so if you're, if you're running a brand organization and, you, and it's in your guidelines not to, to use memes, then I wouldn't use memes. So uh, from a brand organization point of view, um, follow what the guidelines, for, you will have design or social media guidelines of what your organization should run, run, run as a brand. Uh, just because it's popular doesn't mean you should do it. So I, as, as in Bioxcel, I've never tweeted and never used memes because it doesn't fit with what we do. And that's okay. We don't have to, you don't have to go with every trend that works on social media. That's fine. If you are as a person um, running a Twitter account, like your own personal Twitter account, that's fine. You can use memes because I don't see any reason of why you should not be able to do that. Uh, but that's generally my answer to that question. So if, for, if you're an organization, follow whatever the guidelines have been given by your comms department. And if you're a personal, then you should be able to have free reign on what you do on your personal account. Okay, thank you. I think you actually already provided some additional things that when you mentioned how, how to engage, how to start engaging by commenting um, and, and things like that to, to grab, to start to grab attention. Um, yeah. Thank you. Okay, uh, the next question is from Dana. Dana asks, uh, for the organization, i.e., I guess, tweeting as an organization, or trying to, sorry, not tweeting necessarily, engaging on social mm -hmm. media as an organization, how often would you recommend to post the tweets, oh, this is about tweeting, on a daily basis? Is there a recommended time, for example, on the Monday morning? Um... So this is a good question because um, there is often, you know, people say you should be posting three times a day, you should be posting four times a day. Um, and I don't think so that really works. I, I think, yes, uh, when you are starting an organizational account, um, you want to be posting as much as possible because the, as, as the algorithm, the algorithm functions, so the more you tweet, obviously the algorithm is going to push more tweets. So obviously if you suddenly blank, you know, don't talk about anything for like a week or two weeks, you kind of disappear. And it's very hard to restart. So you want to be tweeting as much as you can, but there is no number. So um, if you don't have good content, don't tweet it because then you're just doing it for the sake of doing and it's not, it doesn't look good. So I would recommend if you're starting off to tweet, uh, if you have the content, do it one time. So tweet, post, whatever it is, one time a day, at least. Um, it's okay to do twice a day. There is no, again, there is no set timing. Um, 
that's something you have to do research on your own. So the way I did it was um, I would, I tweeted at different times um, and I tweeted on different days and I got all that data. So you, uh, you have Twitter analytics. So every day platform, social media platform has an analytics you can data. So you look at the data. I looked at the data for three months and I saw, okay, this, this, this time and this, this day works really well for our content. So that's the day that I get the most engagement. And that basically dictated of when I should be tweeting. So I didn't look at some, you know, I didn't Google, um, okay, when should I be tweeting? So you also want to think about where your audience is sitting. So the audience that by itself follows is very generally European. So now obviously I will be tweeting between European, Central European time. Now, if my audience was in Latin America, I obviously wouldn't be tweeting in the morning. I would be tweeting. And if I'm based in Europe, then I wouldn't be tweeting in the morning. I would be tweeting in the afternoon because I need to target that audience that's sitting in that time zone. So that's what would dictate. So I would say start with your own research, just tweet at random times and then look at the data. And then that will tell you when exactly uh, those times and days are work for you better. Okay. Thank you. I think that definitely answers it. Um, okay. Then we have... Uh, Another question um, from Daniel. Uh, when using a network like LinkedIn, where you receive requests to connect with people, many times you receive requests from legit legitimate profiles uh, that you simply uh, know you have no connection with. Um, and if they had a specific purpose for connecting with you, they could write an intertext. You know, so what is your opinion on accepting those requests? I guess if they don't write uh, an intro text, but they just they just try to connect, I guess. Yeah, um, I think that that's very depending on person to person. So I don't accept um, I don't accept requests from people who I don't see an alignment with what I do. Uh, so, for example, if someone's in in the comms field um, and if they if they write, so obviously I will not accept anything from people who don't write an intro text at all. That's just generally a rule I have set up for my LinkedIn. Again, um, in organization LinkedIn, obviously there is no thing as connect. So I'm guessing you're talking about personal. When you talk about yeah person so again if you um if there is no intro text and that depends on you if you just want to increase your linkedin followers because you you will see a lot of people who have 500 plus connections thousand plus connections and you wonder how do they even reach that level when you know they are not posting any content and that's just possibly because people are just you know clicking connect with me connect with me and that's just another strategy for people to increase their following but then again just like any um any other platform then your quality of your you know, the audience who's following you is not good enough because the, the time you want them to reply to something or you, you are posting about an event, you will not see any engagement because they really don't care about your content. They're just there for the numbers. So if that is not, that is not how you want to lead your LinkedIn profile strategy, then I would not accept any requests unless they, there is a reason of why they connected. Always, it's always good to have into text. Um, but that's just like, I think that is just the basis of any networking, even just in person networking, when you collect business cards, it's the same thing. It's just going to sit in a back burner and really doesn't do anything. So it, it all depends on how you want to, um, you know, take your own personal LinkedIn strategy there. Yeah, I think, I think that makes sense. Yeah. So we don't currently have any other questions from attendees. If anybody else has, has a question, please feel free to enter. Uh, I do have one or two things, questions, Alessandra, yeah. if you want to ask as well. Um, <laughs> but I, I have some, some, yeah, some ideas or some questions. So I think uh, you point... Just one thing I want to add. Uh, I will activate uh, a rise hand. So if people ask questions after are no question, they can just use a rise hand. So they, they have less barrier maybe than uh, because we have time. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Okay, good. Um, yeah, so I was wondering, I think you made a, you, you outlined the, the uh, considerations about what platform to choose uh, and the, the first one was basically what platform are, are you comfortable with I mean I guess that might be aimed more at perhaps a personal rather than organizational but even if you're managing an organizational social engage social media engagement you want to do that on a platform where you kind of maybe know what you're doing if there's a if the two platforms are equally appropriate yeah. based on the community but, but so so my question was um, my question was around who isn't on what platform? So who are you missing out on? How to how to from an organizational perspective, maybe choose the right platform based on understanding what community. So you had the the chart showing you know which uh, which country um, and yeah. uh, some of the platforms are more 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 common. Then there's an age breakdown. But if you have an, an example like where you're trying to reach, say example, say for example, trying to reach you know, scientific uh, early early research career 
community for for targeting trying to reach people and engage people for training are you um so for twitter might be good because a lot of people are on twitter for professional reasons or for you know for for this kind of this kind of engagement do we have a sense does anybody have a sense of what part of communities we're missing out to people who are not on twitter are there any systematic kind of sort of biases in terms of who we're missing out who's who, who, who is on twitter and isn't on twitter in a, in a rough sense or is that very difficult to say yeah so i think this is very very um directly related to how much effort and resources you have I think, yes, in an ideal world, if you look at big brands, they are present on every platform. The reason is because obviously you want to reach as many people as you can. That's always the idea of, of being on social media as a social media manager. But if you don't have the resources, that's when that's why I mentioned you only will be active, um, present on one or two platforms. Because the idea is, um, as I mentioned, every platform has a different or requires a different level of effort to capture that community. Now, if you don't have the resources, if you have only one person trying to, um, uh, I can give you a story here. So when I started off uh, with social, uh, with Bikesell, we had only the Twitter account and we had the LinkedIn. The LinkedIn wasn't, um, you know, it wasn't my focus at all because I didn't think there was going to be of any use to it. So I focused my main efforts on Twitter. When I saw the Twitter community growing and growing where I didn't have to put, you know, I put a significant amount of effort in the first six months and I saw, okay, now that's taking off. I don't have to worry about it too much. That's when I went to LinkedIn. And in LinkedIn, I got a different section of audience, probably more industry focused, probably more advanced in their career. And that's where I captured that audience. And I saw that's, that's growing. So we went from, I think, what, 300, 400 followers to 1,000. 300 followers like uh, that was and that was quick that grew very quickly and then what I did was okay I realized okay we're missing out a chunk of people that are you know I didn't see engagement from eastern Europe I didn't see engagement from Asia in our Twitter and LinkedIn communities and I realized okay we're probably missing a huge chunk that would probably be wanted wanting to come to our trainings so I started a Facebook account but now with Facebook is what happens with Facebook is a lot more because it's been in the game for such a long time and its algorithm is completely way different from the other platforms and it's slowing down. I didn't see the results that I wanted. Now, as a one person, as a one person job, this is, it's becoming very hard to manage all these different platforms. And I realized there is no point of me trying to engage or uh, trying to capture that on Facebook. So what I, what we do is we have the email, we have an email list. Again, in digital marketing, you have different platforms. It's not only social media, it's also the email list, but the email list will reach those people in these in these communities that we are probably not capturing on Facebook. So I realized, okay, why am I con concentrating my efforts in on Facebook when it's more complicated and I can just use email to reach those people. So you it's if you have all the resources, if you have a team of three or four people who can do that for you, yes, I would advise you to be on all those communities. But I think that's very, very, very directly related to the amount of time and resources you have because it takes a lot of time to craft content, to find those communities because, and also listening and engaging to those conversations, as I mentioned, it takes a lot of time to actually just sit there and go through all the conversations that people are having and to feed that back. Um, so if you, if you really want to be capturing those communities, then you will have to invest in uh, having a couple of comms people within the team who can then do that for you to capture those communities. All well, that makes sense. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so we have a couple of couple more questions. Um, so uh, Roberta asks, um, to which year does the graph on the platform share time that you were showing refer to? Um, I guess so. Yeah, asking from, from what oh, yeah. the data from is so recent, and is Facebook still so popular today? Yeah, so that I think that's not very. Um, uh, sorry, I, I should have probably gotten the right dates for it. I I think that was sometime in twenty nineteen or twenty eighteen, um, but uh, but the graph still holds true. Um, Facebook is still the dominant platform, even though the the algorithm and you know there is a shift of of the people. You can see a lot of millennials and a lot of Gen Z are on TikTok with the rise of TikTok and rise of Twitter and you know Instagram. It's huge, but um, Facebook still is the dominant player in the game. People are still active on Facebook. They still have a lot of users on their platform. It's a different story of how much, you know, the content is actually reaching. That's a different thing. So if you have money, so the way Facebook posts work is that if you put money behind them, yes. And if you sponsor and put them on there, it will promote. Organic reach, which is basically you just posting by yourself is now limited. And that's the problem with Facebook, which is why a lot of people are turning away from Facebook. So, um, but again, it very much depends on your location. Facebook with that, without the money even is still popular in Latin America. Twitter is not uh, the platform of choice there. So if you wanted to reach a Latin American audience, being on Facebook makes sense to you. If you are trying to reach uh, a more, and again, different demographics, if you're trying to reach more Gen Z, millennial, 
people, then being on TikTok, Instagram is, is the way to go. So again, very, very depends on which who you're trying to target over there. Cool, thanks, I think that's clear. Uh, there's a question from Sian. Sian asks a, uh, a question about Twitter specifically. Uh, he's saying, he's saying uh, I'm perhaps quite active on Twitter with my personal account. Now, particularly in COVID days, with lots of discussions on public health, I wonder how to indicate better whether posting as an expert or posting as a semi-informed member of the public. So I see some people trying to use multiple accounts, for, one for personal, one for professional, but it gets too difficult for him as, as the overlaps are too big. So what's it? Is there any good strategies in this respect? Yeah, that? so um, I, I don't think so. You need to have a personal and professional Twitter account. That's just my, um, that's just the way I think. I think you should just, just have one account. That's fine. And you can decide how you want it to be. So if you just wanted to keep it purely professional, that's fine. If you want to make it more personal, that's fine too. Uh, when we're talking about discussions, so for example, if you are talking more about public health, if you um, don't consider, so that's very obvious so if, if you put in your bio as i mentioned that bio is that is that driving your first impression if you are a public health specialist you can put that in your bio and that's immediately going to tell the person this is a public health specialist who has the expertise in the area and that will give you that first, it will give the audience a first impression of you. okay i'm following a public health specialist if you're not putting that in your bio and if you are talking about different things you know it's people before they start following what they do is they look they they will look at your bio and they will also look at your tweets uh, if you've never talked about public health and you suddenly talk, start talking about COVID randomly, you know, no one's going to immediately just trust that if you don't have the facts to back it up. Um, if, you do, if you don't feel confident in putting posting about public health, retweeting the people who are the actual exper experts is the way to go. And that's generally how I do it. If I don't feel confident in, enough in myself, not, not confident in myself, but if I'm not uh, a public health specialist and I will not pretend or not pretend to be but I will not post that information like I know it I would in fact amplify the people who are who are the ones that are the specialists in this field now if you do have the expertise then it's okay to put that information out there as long as you can always refer back to facts rather it's always good to have a link to some document um, that is verifiable um, and that's just that anything that has an impact on the public always link to verified information because then the people can always click on that link and then see okay what this person is saying is true or not cool yeah that makes a lot of sense thank you uh so i guess in this case tian should make clear that he uh, says in his bio what his expertise is and also says that saying his bio that he's a semi-informed member of the public on other topics uh, but there's not much space in the bio i guess so, um then we have uh, still one, one more question for now that might be might be the last one um uh, also given the time uh goran asks could you provide some general tips on sponsored content is it worth it in the scientific field and how can i decide what type of content justifies a paid campaign yeah um there is obviously there is um uh, i just ran so i'm not i'm generally i would say i'm a social media manager with more expertise in organic which is based what when i mean by organic so you have social media managers that work in organic and in in ads so organic is basically putting out content or post twitter post or linkedin post that don't have any money behind them which is basically free anyone who posts anything on 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 social media and then on social media also allows you to put money behind them so what happens is when you click on a post you can select how much money money um, you want to put behind a post and what happens is then then twitter will then boost that more than your um, organic you know the, the one that doesn't have money on it because that's the way they make that's way that's the way the social media platforms make money by through ads so if you have a budget for it and if you think, uh, say, if you have an event and you want to expand that reach of that event, you can put money behind that and you can run a paid campaign that will run for, say, a particular week. Um, it depends on how much, again, depends very much on your budget. If you have a huge budget, sure, you can put pro probably put that behind every post. But if you come from an organization which doesn't have the relevant budget, then what you can do is select, if you have a big conference coming up, then put money. So we put money behind, um, we, just ran the, uh, we just ran a conference last year, which is the Advances and Challenges in Biomolecular Simulations. And I ran a paid post for that. Uh, so if you have a big major conference coming up, then select the conferences that matter to the organizations and put money behind that. Um, Again, which type of content very much depends on what you are trying to promote. If you're trying to get higher registrations, then you can put money behind that. If it's just maybe, you know, oh, I look at the latest research and you don't think you're really, you know, even if it, it doesn't, if you don't get a lot of people reading it and it doesn't matter, then don't put money behind that. Very much depends on what you're trying to gain out of that campaign. Thanks, that makes sense. I suppose, yeah, it, 
I suppose paying to have your own research gain attention might not be convinced most people. Um, so, uh, Alessandra, I think uh, you want to talk about uh, the next webinar that we have coming up. So first of all, first, let me say again, Michelle, thank you very much. It was a great, very nice thank talk. You. And, and thank you for answering all, all the questions. Um, that's great. But uh, yeah, Alessandra, do you want to um, tell yes. us about the next webinar? Yes, yeah, sure. Yeah. So let me just give the time to share my screen. My presentation, what I want to say. Yeah. So the next uh, Bioxcel webinar will be the 8th of March and we will have uh, what is new in Gromax 20, 20 second, and the speaker will be the Gromax manager, Paul Bauer. And that is all. And I, yeah, I think I will close now the webinar. I thank you, everybody, Michelle and all the attendees, and for the active participation that I really enjoy. Thank you very much for joining.